And um, well, thanks a lot for having me here at this uh, beautiful meeting. I've been really enjoying the talks and I'm also very excited to share some recent results that have been on archive since July this year. And uh, at the heart of this, those two uh, preprints is something that we've called the multipoint functional central limit theorem. And uh, in the first part of the presentation, I'll just set the stage a little bit and give you a very brief, very targeted tour of some aspects of random matrix theory, just to, to sort of set the stage of formulating this theorem. And then in the second part of the presentation, I will say a little bit more about the results. So without further ado, let's uh, introduce the main actors to the stage, which are the ma Wigner matrices that are also um, in the title. And this is a random matrix model that goes back to Eugene Wigner in the 1950s, who introduced it as a model for the energy levels or energy gaps of the complex Hamiltonian. And uh, what we're looking at here mathematically is a real symmetric or complex emission n by n random matrix with entries that are in a sense as IAD as possible while still respecting the symmetry that we prescribe. So for instance, if you have a matrix, you can fix sort of the upper triangle and then fill in the rest. And we further want our the random variables constituting the entries to be centered. We want them normalized in the sense that the variance is equal to one over n. And we also want them to be even nicer by assuming moments of all orders. So uh, from a physics perspective, we're looking at a so-called mean field model. We're hopping from each state into each other state, statistically equally likely. And in true physics fashion, our eigenvalues are real. And one way to describe them as, uh, is through this so-called empirical eigenvalue measure, which is this quantity in the box right here, uh, which is the random probability measure that assigns a mass of one over n to each of the n eigenvalues. And then um, there's already some good news back from Wigner's time, namely that this um, random probability measure converges as the matrix size goes to infinity, weakly, almost surely, to a deterministic one, which we call uh, the Wigner semicircle law. And uh, for the window of the presentation, I want to think of this as a law of large numbers type result, which kind of lives, off this, lives on the scale of all eigenvalues, so on some global scale and uh, give you a little picture to go with it. So this is uh, what it looks like if you just plot the uh, plot a histogram of the, the eigenvalues for a large Gaussian Wigner matrix. And you can see why it's called semicircle law. And in particular, uh, note that this density is supported on uh, minus two to two, um, because those numbers will play a role. Um, so now that we have a global result, um, what about resolving this convergence locally? And this is also possible using the so-called Stiertis transform as a tool. It's an integral transform that looks like this. And it's particularly useful because if you apply it for the empiric empirical eigenvalue measure, you get back the normalized trace of the resolvent of the random matrix that you started with. Um, in particular here, I will write those angled brackets for the normalized trace. And every time you see an angled bracket, they will carry this one over n normalization factor. Um, and with this, now we can We'll resolve this convergence on, on a local scale um, for intervals that still have n to the epsilon eigenvalues, but not necessarily all n of them. And once this local law is established, one now has a very versatile tool for proving a whole bunch of uh, different um, interesting properties for the eigenvalues of Wigner matrices. I've put a couple of buzzwords on this slide. And one thing that for me sort of motivates the study of um, central limit theory and fluctuations is this phenomenon of level repulsion. This is what's um, kind of plotted here. So this is the uh, this is a histogram that shows the eigenvalue gaps. So the difference between two consecutive eigenvalues if you plot them, uh, if you order them by size. And you can see that this graph, this limit uh, kind of dips um, down to zero on the left-hand side. So um, the, the probability of observing small gaps uh, kind of goes to zero or this is why it's called level repulsion in the sense the eigenvalues see each other and kind of repel each other. Um, and on the level of random variable, this is, a, is an indicator that the eigenvalues seen as random variables are actually strongly correlated. And this is something that uh, makes studying central limit theorem particularly hard. So if you remember from, oops, why is my, oh, it is. Um, as if you remember from your probability theory lectures, we want either IID random variables or weakly um, correlated random variables for showing CLTs. However, um, in this case, there's even more good news, namely that the so-called linear eigenvalue statistics that you can see here in this box um, 
if you center them and scale them with one instead of the typical one over square root of n normalization factor from a sort of standard uh, CLT for IID random variables, then this those statistics will satisfy a CLP with a Gaussian limit. And the way that I want to think about this scaling is of either one times the trace or n times the normalized trace, since a lot of the things will be written in terms of the normalized trace. And uh, in a sense, this very unconventional scaling now takes care of all of the effects of the correlations. And very similar to the convergence of semicircle law, so this law of large numbers type result, there are two scales on which one can look at this. So either we're looking at the global scale of uh, all eigenvalues, which corresponds to plugging in a regular and independent function into our statistics, or um, we're looking at something that zooms in into a mesoscopic scale by fixing some uh, E between minus two and two here, uh, staying away a bit from the spectral edges, and then uh, zooming in with some independent um, coefficient here. And uh, this corresponds to the mesoscopic scales. And in both cases, we obtain uh, um, uh, central limit theorem with the Gaussian limit. I've put the little references in brackets. And uh, to complete this little um, study of uh, the literature, let me also um, show you one more result here, which is by the Cipolloni, Adrish, and Schroeder. So you can see the statistic that they're looking at kind of contains uh, the ones that we previously looked at. And what they kind of conclude is that this is, in a sense, inherently tracial, in the sense that this has um, so this little smaller box only involves uh, the eigenvalues, but not the eigenvectors. And by testing against the bounded deterministic matrix here, you can start involving also the eigenvectors into the statistics. And in a sense, you obtain a resolution that goes just beyond this, this tracial regime. And uh, the CLT that they have in the paper now looks like this. So this LN is just the statistics centered. Um, and this is asymptotically Gaussian in the sense of moments. Uh, the reason that we're looking at three different parts here is um, they have observed that if the matrix A is chopped up into three different parts, you actually obtain three different independent modes in the limit. Um, and uh, then there's also the scaling factor Cn. Um, if you're looking at the microscopic regime, meaning all of the functions are n independent, then those Cn's are just order one, so everything fluctuates on the same scale. However, uh, if one looks into the mesoscopic scale, those factors actually become uh, independent, which shows that this, the modes corresponding to the tracial part and the modes corresponding to the tracial parts actually fluctuate on different scales. And you can actually see the, the role of the traceless matrices in here. Um, I also remarked that they obtained explicit variances. Um, however, I will not go into tell here. Um, let me rather introduce the statistics that I want to look at here, which is generalization of the previous ones we looked at. And instead of looking at one function and one deterministic matrix, I want to extend the study to involving k functions and k deterministic matrices. And uh, I will build my, my statistics slowly. So um, just for the case where all of the functions are resolvents, pick some spectral parameter, uh, build the resolvent and then multiply that with one uh, deterministic matrix. This gives me a building block, what I will call T. And then I multiply K of them together, take the normalized trace and then center everything. And those are the statistics that I will look at. And since this is a little bit happy to write, let's just abbreviate things by um, just putting all of the parameters into one multi-index. This is the alpha here that has all the spectral parameters and all of the deterministic matrices that we use. And in particular, just note that the resolvents are computed at different spectral parameters, but this always involves the same Wigner matrix. And uh, of course, this can also be done for more general functions, um, where we can look at, uh, again, two different scales. And for the sake of this presentation, I will state everything uh, for the mesoscopically rescaled functions, because this is kind of the mathematically more interesting regime. Um, so this would mean uh, we pick our E's um, somewhere, um, somewhere between minus two and two, staring away from the spectral edges, and we pick our gammas between zero and one. And then uh, taking some regular test functions, we build again those 
mesoscopically rescaled uh, functions, apply them to the Wigner matrix. And then here, instead of one resolvent, one deterministic matrix, each building block will be one function of the Wigner matrix, one deterministic matrix. Again, we multiply K of them together, take the normalized trace and center them. And in case you're not very fond of this uh, mesoscopic rescaling and it's just too many parameters, it's perfectly fine to think of all of the gammas as zero and just ignore this and ignore the centering. Just think of the test functions as N independent. This corresponds to the macroscopic regime and the theorem that I'm about to state will also work um, in that regime. So um, here we have the theorem. Again, those are the statistics that we're looking at. And uh, long story short, if we multiply it in the same uh, way with n as we did, as we've seen on the previous slides, this will be asymptotically Gaussian in the sense of moments. Uh, one thing that I have not told you yet is what we mean by a regular test function. Actually, it turns out that we can feed this um, Sobolev functions, and uh, this p depends now on the length of the product here. This is the k here, and also this small a, which is the number of traceless matrices among the deter uh, deterministic matrices. So similar to the cipollone adder schroeder result, tracelessness does play a role. And uh, since we're uh, making some remarks, let me also remark that this Gaussian is still independent um, just because the variance involves the functions which have this independent scaling in there. And in the way that it's written here, it's pretty hard to scale out. Um, speaking of variances, this can actually be computed explicitly um, in the sense that we get a big combinatorial sum um, uh, involving integrals with those functions and some kernels. And whenever the Wigner matrix has Gaussian entries, then this can be computed completely explicitly if you're willing to work through the formula. Um, whenever the entries are not Gaussian, then this can also be computed explicitly. However, there are some recursively defined quantities that you need to iterate through first. Then uh, also similar to the cipollone adder schroeder result, there are also ways of producing asymptotically independent modes. Um, however, here um, it's not that uh, we cannot chop, just chop up our deterministic matrices, so K of them. However, one way of producing asymptotically independent modes would be by taking this uh, mesoscopic rescaling and taking one mode that sort of lives around some number E alpha, taking another mode where all functions live around a function E beta. And um, well, in the methoscopic rescaling, there sort of the alpha, E alpha and E beta don't, uh, don't coincide, then sort of the functions don't have anything to do with one another. And in the limit, we will see the modes as independent. And uh, the same, um, let me also make a little note on the proof. Um, and namely that uh, the way that is proven is by first looking at the case where all of the functions are resolvents. And uh, actually it turns out that this case is um, already contains all of the information necessary to prove the full um, functional central limit theorem as one can apply a suitable functional calculus to go from the resolvents to more general functions. And for this reason, I would like to uh, let the te general test functions be for now and just focus more on the resolvent case in the in the rest of the presentation. And uh, the result for resolvents looks like this now. And again, we have this uh, n to the p here that removes the normalized trace. And this removes the normalized trace. So just think of the axis as involving traces. And then we have the expectation of a product of those axes is equal to um, this object here, which is basically a pairing term. Um, and then we also have an error term here. And um, well, I can see that the error also involves um, the k, which is the length of the product, as well as the small a's, which are the number of traceless matrices in um, among the deterministic matrices. And the way that I want to read this as, as an asymptotic VIX rule. So you might remember that if I, uh, that Gaussian random variables satisfy the so-called VIX rule. So if I want to compute the expectation of a product of Gaussians, it's perfectly fine if I just compute the expectation for pairs and then sum over all um, different pairings. 
and this will give me the correct answer. And this is kind of what I what I want to read this as. So again, we have this uh, expectation of a product, and this is equal to some pairing term up to some error. So asymptotically, Wick's rule is satisfied, which allows me to identify the Gaussians in the sense of moment. And this is exactly where the sense of moments in the statement of the functional central limit theorem comes from. Um, the only thing that I have not talked about yet is what exactly this uh, function m is. Well, it's deterministic, that, uh, that much we know. Um, and the rest is something that can be read off from the proof. And it is characterized by three properties. One is uh, symmetry under interchanging of arguments, which you can see since the x's are scalar, just interchanging them doesn't change the left-hand side. So it should also not change the quantity on the right-hand side. We further have an initial condition that tells me that if one of the axes is indexed by the empty set, i.e. one of the axes is equal to zero, then to the leading, leading order, the right-hand side should also be zero. And the key uh, property of the M that one can read off from the proof is a linear recursion with a source term that allows me to go from this initial condition using eventually the symmetry to build up um, this function for more, longer and longer multi-indices. And by inspecting this uh, recursion, namely the source term and the coefficients that we find in it, one can see that this um, leading term here is a function of the spectral parameters that are involved in the resolvents and the deterministic matrices, as well as some parameters of the entry, entry distribution of the Wigner matrix that we put in. However, this is not explicit. And if I want this M for say a uh, multi-index involving say, alpha one involves five spectral parameters and five deterministic matrices and alpha two involves three spectral parameters and three deterministic matrices, then I have to start either with the initial condition or with the sort of minimal example that I computed down here and just run it through the recursion until I have the, um, the length. And uh, this is sort of a minimal example, excuse my little views of notation. This just means that each of them just contain um, one spectral parameter and one deterministic matrix each. And uh, the way this object now depends on the deterministic matrices is by uh, either the normalized trace of the product or the product of the normalized traces or um, this object here, which is a uh, normalized trace of an entry-wise product. Um, on the other hand, the way it depends on the spectral parameters here is through this M, which is the Stieges transform of the semicircle law that we saw very much at the beginning of the presentation. So this is a well-defined deterministic function, which I can evaluate at Z1 and Z2. This will give me a M1, M2. I can compute the derivative. This will give me the prime things, um, and then also take it to some different powers. And you can also see that sort of the distributions that are seen in the Wigner matrix enter as well. And well, now I'm pretty much running out of time. Uh, however, there is also a way to um, actually get a more explicit solution to the recursion, which will allow a direct computation of this function m. Um, however, and uh, also I did not talk about applications. There are actually two different applications that are particularly interesting for this theorem, which are two families of functions for which this can be evaluated. One would be uh, complex exponentials, which in this alternating product allow sort of connecting this uh, statistics to thermalization problems in mathematical physics. On the other hand, if the FJ is a polynomial, then uh, with those alternating products, we're in sort of the classical setting of free probability, which there, um, on one hand, actually reproduces some of the formulas that are known in the literature, but also gives sort of a way of uh, computing those for more general functions. And uh, with this, I think I am done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you a lot, Diana, for this final presentation of the session, three great presentations. Questions? We have quite some time, two, three minutes, four, five. Shake it up, please. Uh, yes, first of all, uh, thank you for a great result, which might be useful for anyone who tries to study Wigner matrices. Uh, I have just one question. Uh, 
when you state your theorem, you have some condition which needs to hold for the test statistic. If I'm if I'm correct, some some sort of a norm is less than one, something like that. So uh, do we know anything in general if that condition doesn't hold? Uh, and uh, another purely technical question, uh, do you probably have a counter example where your theorem doesn't hold? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so first of all, I think the, the norm that you're referring to is uh, just, is uh, maybe the norm of the de deterministic matrices that goes in there, um, which is uh, just uh, for writing things down. Um, and uh, you need the you need the matrices to be bounded in order for this to work. Um, where does it not hold? I mean, there's currently one thing that I'm still investigating, which um, you've seen this uh, restriction of the mesoscopic regime to the bulk. So I put a lot of emphasis on when I go into this mesoscopic rescaling, um, I need to stay away from the spectral edges. Um, so this is uh, one regime where the proof as it is currently will not work due to some of the um, special specialties of the edge regime. And this needs some different tools in order to work out. So right now I can, for instance, not say anything about the edge regime. Thank you very much. Any further question? I would say few of mine and we would have likely time for some more, we will try. Um, firstly, um, you mentioned free probability at the end, and you had products of, uh, I think, some Gaussian matrices. Um, could free probability also be used, say, in the, some extension, I would say, of the central limit theorem or any other study of the properties? Secondly, do you have any intuition? I also noted this bulk now that you mentioned what to do on the edges. So how to study the properties in the edges. And finally, I do not know precisely the Wigner matrices, but those are Hermitian Wigner matrices. Could possibly this be extended? There are many types, say also for the ensemble matrices, beta ensembles, you know that we have Jacobi, Laguerre, and so on. Could this be extended also there? Naturally, there are a lot of extensions in terms of free probability, maybe traffic probability, which you might know is very recent by Camille Mal and Guyan Chebron. Thanks. Yeah. Right, let me try to start at the start. Um, so the way the free probability comes in here is not necessarily as a tool, but it's actually more of a parallel that one sees here. So what has been uh, done before I started working on the CLT was the deterministic approximation for for the, um, well, sort of the, the law of large numbers set result. Um, which showed um, some parallels to the uh, combinatorics sort of in the explicit formula for the leading term shots and par um, parallels to the combinatorics that are usually encountered in free probability. Um, so for instance, in this asymptotic freeness of Wigner matrices. Um, and uh, the way that this the free probability comes in here for the, for the CLT is in a very similar way. So one can compute the, the leading term for um, sort of, yeah, the leading term, this M, just the deterministic approximation uh, for the for the covariance, and it turns out that this also has this uh, very very similar structure, at least uh, for for GUE, where it can be computed fully explicitly, and that it looks like uh, from the from the combinatorial point of view, like free, second order free probability. So you have the same kind of combinatorics that go in there of uh, annular non-crossing partitions and permutations. However, this the, the tool and the proof is, is purely like resolvent method and cumulant expansions and uh, things like this. So in the, in the proof itself, there's no free probability tools. Um, I have to ask to remind me of the second and third question. So maybe just uh, when you have this GUE, could this be extended to ensemble matrices apart from the Hermitian ones? Jacobi, Laguerre? Okay. I, have to, I have not looked into that, but actually I will probably note this down uh, to, to, uh, to look into further because it's interesting.